in her chambers. And so as we anticipated that she was going to be gone for a while, what's that old saying? When the cat's away, the mice will play. And so there was some expectation that the mice would play some. In particular, there was that expectation for those members of the judge's chambers who were female. Uh, she had a female legal assistant, and she had a couple of female clerks. I was a male clerk. And my judge at that time had a rule for those that worked in her chambers. And the rule was if you were female, you wore dresses. Now she understood that some people wore pantsuits and that sort of thing, but she didn't like that. She didn't care for that. And so she figured now, the way I look at it, I was the one nominated by a president. I was the one who was confirmed by the Senate. You're in my chambers. And so when you're in my chambers, you're going to follow my rules. And so the rules were, if you were a female, you wore a dress. And that's what they did until she left. And she went out of town. Oh, there was some excitement now. Here comes those jeans. We're going to wear jeans now. We wore jeans. Happy. Well, they thought they knew when the judge was going to come back. But they were wrong. Judge came back early, and boy, I tell you what, I was just glad I wasn't on the wrong side of that rule. <laughs> I tell that story because it does illustrate a principle of knowing when the master is coming back. And see, the problem was is they thought they knew when the master was coming back, but they were wrong, and they weren't prepared. They had not done what the master wanted them to do. They had done something else, and they were caught because they thought she was coming at a time when she came at a different time. Now, I'm not particularly worried about working in a judge's office and that sort of thing, but I didn't want to use that to talk about something that we all need to be aware of and all need to be concerned about, and that is the second coming of Jesus, our master, because he's coming back. And unlike the situation perhaps with a judge where we uh, could have thought we knew when she was coming back, we know, we have no idea when the Lord is coming back. And so it begs the question then, how should we live with that ever-present reality that Jesus is coming and we don't know when? How do we respond to that? And so that's the title of the sermon uh, this evening, Living in Anticipation of the Second Coming of the Lord. Living in Anticipation of the Second Coming of the Lord. Before we get into the substance of that message, I just wanted to say a few words to thank everybody here for what has been a very exciting gospel meeting for me. I can't speak to the preaching, but I can speak to the interaction that I've had with many of you afterwards, and I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Appreciate the comments about the sermons. I appreciate the suggestions, the recommendations for additions. I've picked up some things that I, if I preach this again or some of these sermons again, they'll be in there as well, and so I appreciate that so very much. I appreciate you sharing with me your lives. Many of y'all have told me some things about how you came to follow the Lord or things that you're doing with the Lord, and it's so exciting to hear that. It's one of the things I love about traveling to different churches is to hear how different people obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. How were they led to the gospel, and what are they doing in their lives to serve God now? And I want to thank the elders for the leadership that they've exhibited here. Uh, I have been teasing everybody, saying this has become the it congregation in the Birmingham area. But boy, I tell you, I hear a lot of good things about y'all. <laughs> Every time I turn around, somebody's talking about this Gardendale congregation. And I see the buzz. I see the excitement. I see why people are talking about it. So you got a good thing going here. Now, don't lose it now. Don't take it for granted. You got to work for it. You got to keep it going. Don't get complacent. But a lot of good things are being said by this congregation. And I got to witness those firsthand this week. So I thank you. Now, I want to apologize. You weren't able to extend the hospitality to me that you would have because of my crazy work schedule. But I know y'all would have had a meal on this, and I would have had some wonderful meals and got to know y'all better, and I, I just owe you one on that. Maybe one of these days when I'm not working so hard, I'll be able to take advantage of that opportunity and even miss the potluck, and I heard that was fantastic, and so I hope y'all ate some for me as well. But I do, do appreciate, I mean, every night, I, I just, I walked away from this building, got in my car, and I thought, man, God's people are some great people. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, you're just on a spiritual high, just talking with folks and getting to know people, and it's just, I think this is a foretaste of heaven. It's a foretaste of heaven. If you like this, boy, you're going to love heaven. And so I appreciate so very much what you've done. But let's talk about 
our subject uh, tonight, living in anticipation of the second coming. And the first point we want to make is that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. I want you to know that. That's not an opinion. That's not a, a prediction. Uh, that's, that is a fact. Jesus will come back. Jesus is coming back. The Bible teaches that. Jesus taught that. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, turn over there. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Jesus himself said that he was coming back. John the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 6. Living in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus, the first point we're making is that Jesus is coming back. And here we see in John 14, 1 through 6, that Jesus himself said that he was coming back. John 14, 1 through 6, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. That's Jesus speaking. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, here's the promise, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? He said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we spend a lot of time when we talk about this passage, about verse 6, but the singular way, I'm the way, I'm the life, I'm the truth, an absolutely appropriate point to make. But what I want to make for purposes of tonight is that earlier point in verse 3 that Jesus promises. He says, I will come back. And if there's anything you know about the promises of the Lord they are good. They are solid. You, you can absolutely assume and trust that it will happen. If Jesus says he is coming back, and he did, then he will be coming back. You and I may not see it in our lifetime. It doesn't matter. He's coming back. It may be 10 years from now. It may be 50 years from now. It may be 100 years from now. That promise is no less strong because of the passage of time. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. We'll make that point uh, in just a little bit from the Scriptures. But that doesn't take away from the fact that he's coming back. And so if Jesus is coming back, then we have to make some preparations. We've got to be ready. I mean, that's a fact that, that really we have to wrestle with, just like we have to wrestle with the empty tomb. Got to make something of that. What are you going to do with that empty tomb? We've got to do something with the fact that Jesus is coming back. But not only did Jesus say that he's coming back, did you know that the angels told the apostles that Jesus was coming back? Turn over to Acts chapter 1. Verses 9 through 11, Jesus is coming back. Not only did Jesus say that he was coming back, the angels told the apostles that he's coming back. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Acts, the first chapter, verses 9 through 11. Now when he, a reference to Jesus, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, the apostles, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now listen to what these men say, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So these two men, these two angels said, Why are you looking up into heaven? Do you not know that this same Jesus, this same Lord, this same Messiah, this same Son of God, he will come back. That was a promise from the messengers of God. Jesus is coming back. But not only that, we read even earlier in this gospel meeting. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We read that the scriptures themselves also teach that Jesus is coming back. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 18. Jesus is coming back. Begin with verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with them those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, those Christians who had died in the Lord. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, listen this, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that Jesus is coming back. We've got some details here. He's going to come with a shout. He's going to come with the voice of an archangel. He's going to come with the clouds. But the point being is Jesus is coming. And that was supposed to be part of comfort. Comfort. Because when he comes, you know, the folks that have died in Jesus, those folks are going to be with him. And those of us who are here when he comes back will be changed in a twinkling of eye. And so the point being is there's comfort in knowing that the Lord is coming back. We need to encourage one another with that. We need to remind each other the one of, that, of, of that fact. That's an important fact. Our whole lives are oriented around that fact. If that fact's not true, then what are we doing? Jesus is coming back. We believe that. Do you profess that? Do you tell your friends that? Do you tell your neighbors that? Do you tell your coworkers that? Do you tell your employer that? Are you ashamed of saying that? It's true. You ought to be looking for, as we're going to see in just a little bit, looking for and hastening that second coming. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. There's nothing wrong talking about the second coming of God. He's coming back. And we ought not be ashamed of that. That's a fact. And it's important that not only we understand that, it's important that those around us understand that. Because you've got, as we're going to make this point all through the sermon, you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to be ready for that. That's just not, not something you let happen. You've got to be ready for the second coming of the Lord. So my question to all of you, are you ready? If the Lord were to come back tonight, are you ready? Don't give me the politically correct answer. I want the honest answer. I want the standing in the mirror and looking at yourself. Am I ready to meet the Lord if he comes back tonight? We'll talk some more about that in just a minute. So we've established from the scriptures that Jesus said he was coming back. The angels told the apostles he's coming back, and the scriptures teach he's coming back. Well, let's make a second point. And this is a point we talked about at the very beginning. No one knows except for the Father when Jesus is coming back. No one knows except for the Father when Jesus is coming back. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 36. No one knows when Jesus is coming back. This is a very important aspect of the second coming of Jesus. We don't know. You don't know. I don't know. When is the Lord coming back? We don't know. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour, contrasting from the destruction of Jerusalem, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then jump down to verses 42 through 44. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's the difficulty of it. Is That's the challenge of it. We don't know when it's going to happen. He says nobody knows. He says not even. Now think about this. Not even the angels in heaven know. And then he goes on to say the only one who does know is the Father, which would exclude who? Jesus himself doesn't know when he's coming. When the Father says, come, he's going to come. But see, there's no way we can ascertain that. There's no way we can develop We don't know that. And so what is the message? Well, the message, he says, you be ready. Always be ready. See, there, there's not a point that you can say, all right, this is going to happen in the future, and I'll get ready just before that. But right now, I'm just going to live any other way. You know that's what human beings would do. If the Lord had said, now I'm coming back, in uh, 2022, January 15th, 2022, that's when I'm coming. You know what a lot of folks would do. They would just live any other way, to do whatever they want to do, and then it rolls around January 14th. All right, let's tighten up now. Let's start going to services, start reading the Bible, and start praying. All the things we know we should have been done all along, but you know we're playing now. We're going to procrastinate. We're going to put it off. I liken it to what I do whenever uh, my wife goes out of town. Uh, now, my wife, she is, I mean, when they have the Hall of Fame of house cleaners, my wife is going in on first ballot. I guarantee you. She's going in, man. She's going in. That would be unanimous. Nobody is going to question that. My wife believes in a clean, organized house. The problem is I don't believe in that so much. So, you know, 
Now, I believe it when she's there because I got to keep peace. But, you know, you know, sometime like this weekend, we had an opportunity. She went uh, over to Georgia, and I had come in from my arbitration. I was bone tired, and, of course, I had the meeting starting. So I stayed behind, so I had bachelor's day out. And, man, that's some fun days, man, because, you know, I get to bring the food in, and maybe I'll order some pizza or something. I keep the pizza stuff on, on, the, uh, on the table, and I don't put things up and throw my shoes around. I keep them over there, take my clothes off, ties everywhere. Hey, I, I, don't, I don't do anything. I mean, I just, that's the way I like to live. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sloppy, okay? And I don't have to worry about it because wife is not there. She's not there to watch me. She's not there to get upset. So I can live any other way. But here's what happens every time. Right before my wife comes home, Man, I'm like the Tasmanian devil. I'm cleaning, vacuuming, washing stuff, taking out the trash, putting the shoes back, getting those crumbs off, the t- all that stuff, just a lot of activity. And it got worse this time because this time one of her cousins was coming with her. Oh, no. I've almost got to the point where I'm like, just don't bring anybody over because, you know, it, it, it's like on steroids when it comes to cleaning. It's like this is the normal cleaning and somebody's coming over and it'd be fine if she'd leave me out of it, but I got to be a part of this too. And so now I'm cleaning all that stuff. But, you know, I think that's the way we would do with the Lord. We just kind of wait to the last minute and put everything in order. And you can't do that because we don't know. You can never say, well, I think I can relax. I don't have to be as faithful in my prayer life uh, this particular week because the Lord's not coming. I don't have to worry about studying the Scripture so much because, you know, the Lord's not coming this week. I don't have to be as self-controlled with my tongue or with my lust because the Lord's not coming this week. I can kick that down the road. To, you, you can't do that because the Lord could come at any time. And that leads me to my third point, which is this. We're going to be judged based on the state in which the Lord finds us when he comes. Let's say that again. We're going to be judged based on the state in which the Lord finds us when we come. We can't say to the Lord, oh, but Jesus, you know, I served you faithfully for 15 years. And yeah, I know I kind of fell off the wagon the last five years, but what about that 15 years of service? We're going to be judged based on the state we're in when he comes. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. 1 John, the second chapter and verse 28. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. We're going to be judged based on the state in which the Lord finds us. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Notice the admonition, abide in him, stay in Jesus. Why? What's the motivating factor? Why would I want to stay in Jesus? He says, you need to stay in Jesus so that when he comes, you have confidence Instead of being ashamed. Now, why would I be ashamed? Because of the state that the Lord finds me. If I'm living in sin, I'd be ashamed. If I'm disrespecting the Lord, I'd be ashamed. If I'm not being that faithful and diligent student of the Word of God, I'd be ashamed. He says, don't be ashamed when the Lord comes. Be in a state, be in a condition that you can have confidence when the Lord comes. I don't know if you've tried this, but it's one of the greatest incentives to stay faithful especially if you're, if you're wrestling with sin that's very intentional. Now, I know some sin kind of jumps up on you a little quickly, but if there's any, any intent at all, just think to yourself, what if the Lord were to come back right now? And I'm going to tell you, folks, it fortifies your spirit. Because <laughs> you know what that means. You don't want to be caught doing this thing that you know is wrong If the Lord comes back, and so ask yourself, when you feel yourself being tempted by the devil, if I were to do what the devil is tempting me to do, and the Lord were to come back right now, how would I feel about that? And you'll be amazed at how much resolve it'll give you to resist the temptations of the devil. Because you you know what that means. It ought to to terrify you. The prospect of being caught like that. You don't want to be caught like that. He says, don't don't be involved in things that will make you ashamed. He said, do things that you have confidence when the Lord comes back. It's supposed to be a good thing. It's supposed to be something we're eagerly anticipating. But here's the thing. You can't eagerly anticipate the second coming of the Lord unless you're right with the Lord, right? You can't. I mean, if you're living in sin, you you don't want the Lord to come back. You know what that means. Even though you're a Christian, but you're a Christian in name only, you know what the second coming, Lord. You're not saying, Lord, come quickly, because you know what that means. And so in order for us to say, Lord, come quickly, in order for us to hasten the second coming, we've got to be living right. 
right? That's what we said again every night, the invitation that Paul told Timothy, you got to live right, got to teach right. So that's a litmus test. You know, are you living right with the Lord? So when you go to bed every night, I hope that you can feel confident and say, hey, you know, if the Lord comes tonight, I'm okay. I'm okay. But if you have that feeling, and sometimes I've had this, where you're like, Lord, not tonight. Don't go. What does that say? You're not right. You get something right. Whatever is wrong, whatever is off, get it taken care of. We know this because there are implications of that. We've got to stay in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Look at 2 John 9. 2 John 9. That's an ammunition for us to stay in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. 2 John 9. 2 John 9 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. I love that. The idea of abiding, of living, of staying within. If you think about, you know, the four corners, God's doctrine, he says, you stay right there within the corners of that doctrine. That's how you live. You don't step outside. You don't get outside of that. You stay right within the doctrine of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. If you do that, then 1 John 2, 28, you can have confidence when the Lord comes. But if you're stepping outside of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, there's no confidence in that. You can't have any confidence when the one whose doctrine you've stepped outside of is coming back. <laughs> you want to stay within that. We've got to be careful about that. And we've said this before. Let's don't get complacent. Those of us who are members of the body of Christ, let's don't get complacent simply because we were baptized into Christ. We, we praise God for that. Hallelujah. That you were baptized into Christ. But it's so much more than just being baptized. It's not a one-time event. I'm baptized, and I'll check my one-way ticket to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. Look at uh, one of my favorite passages, Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Hebrews, the third chapter, 12 through 13. Hebrews chapter 3, 12 through 13. Hebrews, the third chapter, verses 12 through 13. We need to live in anticipation of the second coming because we know that whatever state we're found in, that's the state we're going to be judged in. Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Hebrews, the third chapter, 12 through 13. The Bible says this. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, who is he talking to? He says, beware, brethren. And so these are people that have been baptized into Christ, right? These are people that have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We said some people think that just being baptized into Christ is sufficient. He's talking to people who have been baptized into Christ. And what does he say? He says, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did he just say it's possible for me to have been baptized into Christ but later develop an evil heart of unbelief? That's absolutely what he said. And then he goes on to say, in departing from the living God and departing from the living God. Okay, so for you to depart from something, you have to first have been with that something, right? If I say I've departed Gardendale, it doesn't make any sense if I've never visited Gardendale in my life. I have to have been in Gardendale and then leave Gardendale. And so he says in departing from the living God, that means these are people who were with God at one point in time, and they left God. Well, that seems counter to once saved, always saved. Absolutely, it's counter to that. It is possible for us to have been saved and then lose that salvation. And in fact, he sets it up nicely. He says, okay, because that is possible, because that can happen, then what are we supposed to do? Exhort one another daily while it's called, called today. You see that? The two are connected because we can fall away, any one of us, the preacher can fall away, any one of the deacons can fall away. Any one of the elders can fall away. Any one of the elders' wives can fall away. He said, now, because that present reality is that threat, that risk is always there, it can happen. Let's don't take that for granted. Let's encourage one another daily. Every time we have an opportunity, because we want to make sure everybody stays in that narrow room, because we can get off, we can detour, we can take the exit ramp. You see that? So we can't just assume, because we were baptized into Christ, that we're going to be saved. That passage says that. To the contrary, we need to assume there's a possibility that we could be lost. Let's make sure that doesn't happen. And one of the ways we do that is we encourage 
one another daily. We're reaching out. We're calling. We're texting. We're visiting. Anything we can to remind people, this is what we're here for. We're here to serve the Lord. Be faithful. Be strong. We can't be complacent because the state in which we live, when the Lord comes back, the state in which we're found, that's the state we're going to be judged by. And we certainly don't want to get to this state. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 27. We certainly don't want to get to this state. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. Hebrews the 10th chapter, verses 26 through 27. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. If we sin willfully, we don't want to find ourselves in that state. Because he says, you know what? When you get to that point, notice what he says, you no longer have the sacrifice for sins. Think about that. If you no longer have the sacrifice for sins, what does that mean? It means at some point in time, you had that sacrifice. You had the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus that you could avail yourself of. It was there. You had it. But he says, no longer. You had it. You lost it. And in place of that confidence that you should have through the blood of Jesus Christ, what do you have? Abject terror. Because you know what lies ahead. That's the worst part of it. Think about it. People of the world sometimes don't know. But a person who has obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and then goes back out into the world, that person knows full well what's coming. And it ought to scare them to death. And hopefully it scares them to the point they repent and come back. But the point being is, we don't want to get complacent. We don't want to be like these folks. We don't want to be like the folks uh, over in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Turn over there. Hebrews chapter 5, sorry, verses 12 through 14. Hebrews 5th chapter, verses 12 through 14. Listen to this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Did you see that? He says, look, there's, there's a relationship between time and growth. Between time and growth. He's saying, look, once you have been baptized into Christ, there's a certain amount of time that goes by where at that point you ought to be in a position where you can teach other people, right? You've been in the faith long enough. You're not a babe anymore. You're not a rookie. You're a veteran. You've been in it long enough. You ought to be in a position to teach the first principles of Christ. You ought to be able to teach others. He said, here's the shame of it all. He said, not only can you not do that, even though you've been in the faith long enough to do that, he said, you know what? You yourself need to go back and be taught the very first principles again. That's embarrassing. You're supposed to be a college professor and you got to go back to kindergarten. That's embarrassing. That can happen. That can happen if we're complacent. That can happen if we stop studying our Bible. We talked about that on Sunday. I worry sometimes about our, our Bible class. You know, and, and when it comes to the younger kids, we're so diligent about teaching and evaluating the teaching, how effective is the teaching. We have the test. We have the quizzes. We have the homework. We have the memory work. All this stuff that we do. And then they graduate to the adult class, and then, ah, no accountability. There are no tasks, no quizzes, there are no memory verses. And I'm not saying it has to be that, but how many times have you seen this? Or how many times have you done this? You roll up, you roll up into the adult Bible class, and you haven't studied one iota. You haven't even cracked your Bible. But you've got this cumulative knowledge for all these years you've been in the Lord, and you just rely upon that. And the Bible teacher will ask a question, and you say a statement, raise your hand, you make a statement. It's as true as the day is long. It has absolutely nothing to do with the text under consideration. Have you seen that before? Have you, I've seen that. That's just relying upon cumulative knowledge. That person hadn't studied. We need to be studying, hold ourselves accountable. We don't want to be like these people in Hebrews 5, where we ought to be teaching, but now we need to be taught again. So again, what's the point? Don't be complacent. Don't take it for granted. Understand that the state that you're in when the Lord comes back, that's the state that you're going to be judging. You can't say, hey, Lord, back in the day, man, I was really on top of it. I was faithful and I was studying and I was praying and I was close to you. And I, we're not talking about back in the day. We're talking about when the Lord comes back, where are you? And the point is we always need to be and must be faithful to the Lord. There's no time that we can say, oh, well, I'll risk it. 
When people do that, they are gambling with their souls. They're taking a chance that they'll have enough time to come to their senses and come back to the Lord. And you don't know if you're going to get that time. You may not get it because the Lord comes back, or you may not get it because you die before that happens. But either way, is the point is the Lord's telling us, you need to be ready for me. Stay ready. Stay prepared. I don't know about you, but that's the thing that scares me more than anything is just the general notion of not being prepared. I, I have a, a dream that just is recurring. I just have it all the time. And it's something along the fact that I'm in school, I'm probably in college, and I've got several classes, and there's a class that somehow, some way, I've totally forgotten. I haven't been going to classes. I haven't been doing the homework. And then I get shocked when one day there's this exam in this class that I've done nothing in. And I mean, I, 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 that terrifies me. And, and, and it's, it's an, indic an indication that I'm scared of being unprepared. I mean, that, that's it. That's my life. I don't want to be unprepared. I'm not care about Frankenstein and Dracula and the werewolf and all those guys. I care about being unprepared. By the way, all those things are not true in case somebody comes out here saying no to us. Um, but this is the one place where you better not be unprepared when it comes to our soul salvation, when it comes to the Lord coming back. We do need to think about that and examine ourselves. In fact, here's the point. What's the connection between the knowledge that the Lord's coming back and we don't know when He's coming back and how we live our lives? Well, Peter addresses that in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, right? Let's turn over there. What's the connection between the Lord's coming back, we don't know when, and how we live our lives? 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. 2 Peter the third chapter, 10 through 13. Here's the connection right here. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. 2 Peter the third chapter. Verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 11, look at this. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Did you see right there? He asked the question, how should we live in light of this knowledge? Knowing that the Lord's coming back, knowing that when he does, everything in this universe is going to be destroyed. How should we live? And he kind of answers the question uh, in the question itself. Because he says, in holy conduct and godliness, that we ought to be holy because of that knowledge and understanding. We ought to live righteously because of that knowledge and understanding. We ought to live self-controlled lives because of that knowledge and understanding. We ought to be faithful to the Lord because of that knowledge and understanding. See, there is a practical application to that theological knowledge. Sometimes we want to just talk about the theological and keep it up there. Oh yeah, Jesus is coming back. Interesting doctrine. Move on. No, you can't move on because if Jesus is coming back and we don't know when he's coming back, then we ought to live a certain way. That's what Peter said. And did you notice Peter goes even further? It's more than just the absence of sin. He says we ought to be looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord. Wow. We can't wait till the Lord comes back. Now, that, that's different, right? That's not, uh, well, you know, if he comes, uh, you know, that's fine. I'll make sure I'm ready. No, I can't wait. I'm eagerly anticipating. Have you thought, think of a day that you've eagerly anticipated. Maybe, maybe it's a birthday. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a, a football game. Maybe it's football season. You know, we go that period of time, dead man's land when there's no football, and then finally it's coming. And whatever it is, whatever that day is, can you remember just counting the days down, just can't wait till it happens? That's the way we're supposed to be about the second coming of the Lord. Now, here's a question. Don't raise your hand. Don't say out loud. Do you feel that way? Are you looking for and are you hastening the second coming? And if you're not, why not? And what does that say about where you are in your relationship with God? I know we can come up with a lot of reasons why, well, we're not quite ready. But my Bible that I just read says that Christians ought to be looking forward to the second coming of God. 
And we need to eagerly want it. If we're not there, we need to work on it, folks. Something is off about our attitude. Because we've got to remember, this is not the end-all, be-all. We get caught up in this. This is temporary. Peter says that we're pilgrims. We're sojourners. We're just passing through to get to home. And sometimes we forget about that, and we make home during the journey. Uh Uh-uh. Home is heaven. If home is heaven and Jesus is going to take us there, we want Jesus to come back. Paul understood that. He says it's better to depart and be with Christ in Philippians 1. He said the only reason that's holding me back here is is for y'all's benefit. i got some work to do for y'all to get y'all prepared for the Lord. That's the only thing that was holding him back. It wasn't football games and fishing and and, and trips and second homes and and, and careers and I just love it here. No, no. It was there's some spiritual work to be done, but personally for my benefit, it'd be better if I go be with the Lord. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that way? That's what Peter is telling us. We need to be eagerly anticipating. We can't wait to see the Lord. If we have that kind of attitude, then we, we're doing something right when it comes to our walk. And if we're not that way, we need to keep working. We've got work to do. But let's talk about a few things before our time is out. So we've talked about that Jesus is coming back, and we established that Jesus said he was coming back, that the uh, angels told the apostles that he's coming back, the scriptures teach that he's coming back. We established that nobody knows except for the Father when he's coming back. We established that the state that you're in when he comes back, the state that you're found in, that's the state that you're going to be judged in. And now we start talking about some practical applications. One of those practical applications, point number four, would be this. Don't, and this is kind of similar to what we said last night, don't procrastinate about getting sin out of your life. Don't procrastinate about getting sin out of your life. You know, we love to procrastinate, don't we? Why do today what we can put off tomorrow? (laughs) That's the way we live. Just kick the can down the road. And I'm telling you, when it comes to getting sin out of your life, we talked a lot about that, so we won't recover all that ground. But I do want to make this point. The time to get rid of that sin is now. It's not a month from now. It's not a New Year's resolution. It's not a couple years from now. It's not, as uh, one of my uncles said, whenever he retires and he has more time for religion and he never got that, he died at 37. The, The time to get sin out of your life is now. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. Colossians, the third chapter, verses 5 through 11. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. The Bible says this, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, whether there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. We need to root this stuff out of our lives, folks, and we need to start doing it now. There's an urgency to it. Get sin out of your life. You can do it. You've got all the tools you need. You've got the Word of God. You've got prayer. You've got other brethren. You've got confession. Everything you need to get it done is right here. So if we're not doing it, whose fault is it? It's our fault. Let's get it out of there. Let's get our minds, renewing our minds. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, it talks about renewing the mind. This is where the battle's fought. Be careful what you expose your minds to. Be careful what you read. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you watch. Why? Because we want this in pristine uh, condition. It needs to be holy like the Lord is holy. It needs to be pure. It needs to be unadulterated. It is hard enough to fight Satan on our own, and a lot of Christians handicap themselves voluntarily by just exposing themselves to anything. No. You've got to be careful. Be, guard your mind. Guard your hearts. For out of these spring the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. And so we want to be really careful. Get sin. Don't procrastinate. If you've got sin in your life right now, let's do something about it right now. Quit putting it off. And a lot of times we put it off because we don't want to give it up. We enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, uh, of sin as Hebrews 11, 24 through 27 talks about. And we, we're just not ready. And we keep telling ourselves, we lie to ourselves, well, I'll get rid of it tomorrow, but today I'm going to indulge in it. I'll get rid of it later, but right now a little, a little bit won't hurt me. And every time you do that, you're getting farther and farther away from the Lord. And yes, that can happen to Christians too. We just established once saved, always saved is not true. And so don't think, well, I'll come back to the Lord later. I'll get, you may never come back. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about a group of people 
who were in the Lord and they get out of the Lord and they get to a state where they will not come back. It's not because of the blood of Jesus and any deficiency in that. It's because of their will. They don't want to come back. Don't play with sin, folks. Sin will take you out of the body of Christ and you may not come back. And so the point is, don't procrastinate about getting sin out of your life. Second point about not procrastinating, don't procrastinate about teaching others. Don't procrastinate about teaching others. Let me ask you this. Is there somebody in your life right now? Maybe it's an uncle. Maybe it's an aunt. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's a school a classmate. Maybe it's a neighbor. Somebody that you know is lost and needs the gospel. And you've thought about that. And you've thought about what you need to do. You need to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to that person. And you try to find this the ideal time, the right time. It's never the right time. That's something else going on. We're busy. I don't want to upset them now. This is not the place. This is not the time. And you just keep kicking the can down the road. Don't procrastinate in teaching others. A soul's salvation is at stake. It's too urgent. And you don't know when their time is up. And so we need to quit procrastinating. If we know that people in our lives need the gospel and we understand the gospel, we need to open our mouths. We need to start doing it. Don't worry about the blowback. Don't worry about the feedback. Don't worry about uh, whether you lose the friendship or not. What's most important is get the information out there so that they have an opportunity to act upon it. You know, that's the way Paul was. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. Paul was the kind of guy, he just had to get the gospel out there because he was so concerned about the souls of other people. And we need to be the same way. We're so concerned about the souls, more concerned about their souls than our pride or our consequences or our possessions or our standing. All of that pales in comparison to the value of one single soul that we have the opportunity to help bring to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 9 through 11. Listen to Paul's attitude. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Now listen to verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. For we are well known to God, and also, I trust, are well known in your consciousness. Did you see the connection there? He says, we know the terror of God. We understand what lies ahead for those who are outside the body of Christ. We understand hellfire. We understand eternal separation from God. We appreciate that. We understand that. We know that. He says on the basis of that knowledge, on the basis of that appreciation, on the basis of that understanding, he says, you know what I do? I persuade men. You see that connection? The understanding of hellfire that lies ahead for people that are outside of God or outside of Christ, he says, based on that understanding, that motivates me, that compels me to persuade. That's teaching. That's teaching. So here's the question. You understand hellfire. You understand the eternal separation from God. We've talked about it during this meeting. Do you feel like Paul does, where you're just compelled? You can't, you can't shut up about Christ because you know people need him. It bothers you. Remember Acts 17, uh, before we even got to the sermon at Mars Hill, Paul is waiting for his traveling companions. He's just looking around Athens, and it disturbs him that he sees all these people given over to idolatry. Does it disturb you to see people caught up in false doctrine? Does it disturb you to see people who are lost? It should. And then if it does, the natural reaction to that is to teach. You see? I'm disturbed. I care. I'm concerned. Therefore, I teach. You see that? Jesus had compassion on the crowd and began to teach them many things. That's the connection. Does it bother you to see people who are outside of the Lord's body? It should. It should bother us. It should bother me. It should motivate us to teach. That's the point I was making. Everybody has to teach in the body of Christ. Sometimes we get that wrong. We think, well, uh, uh, the preacher needs to be teaching, and, and, and the deacons need to be teaching, and maybe the elders need to be teaching, but not everybody. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. Don't procrastinate in teaching others if you understand the second coming of the Lord could be at any time. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 24 through 26. The Bible says this, and a servant of the Lord, I want you to underscore that, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, listen to this, able to teach. Huh. 
So did, did he say, and, and, and a preacher of the gospel must be able to teach. No. And a elder of the Lord's church must be able to. No. And a deacon of the church must be at. No. And he said, a servant of the Lord. Are you a servant of the Lord? I am. Everybody who's been baptized into Christ is a servant of the Lord. And so it just says, a servant of the Lord must be what? Must be able to teach. Let's keep reading. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Here is the perspective of a servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord looks out and sees people around him, people around her that are in their classes, in their workplace, in their neighborhoods, in their family reunions, and he sees people who are what? Captive by the devil. They're, they're prisoners of war. Have you, do you think about people that? Spiritually, you're around a bunch of people who are prisoners of war. They are captive to the devil. And what we're supposed to do is to take the truth, the light of God's word, and use that to liberate them from those prison camps, right? We want them to come out of that captivity. And we do so in humility. We're not arrogant about it, like we're so something special and wonderful. No, we just we were in the same boat. We were right there in the prison camp with them, but we came out because we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're humbly just asking people to do what we did. That's what the servant of the Lord sees the world as. Teaching opportunities all around him or her. All of us have that obligation. So I ask, at Christianity is a teaching religion. I want to ask you, are you teaching? And if you're not teaching, let's be honest about this. If you're not teaching, how do you think it's going to go for you on judgment? I want you to remember that the one who's doing the judging is the Son of God who left heaven, Luke 19.10, to seek and to save that which is lost. You have availed yourself of His sacrifice you have been washed in his blood, but you don't dare to open your mouth to teach? And you think he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Uh, I think we're in for a rude awakening, if that's what we think. And I'm not dismissing the importance of moral living. It's a necessary thing, but it's not sufficient because the Lord demands that we teach. That's every one of us. And so if you're here tonight and you haven't been teaching, may I urge you to repent of that? and to start teaching. And don't give me that, well, I'm not good on my feet, and I'm not quick-minded, and I'm not, I'm not smart, and I didn't do well at school, and I don't memorize things well, and, and I get all nervous, and I don't know exactly what to say. All you need is this. That's all you need. Some of the most effective teaching I've ever done is when I got myself out of the way and just said, hey, have you considered Acts 2.38? Have you considered Mark 16, 61? But pull that out. Read that. What does that say? Have you looked at Hebrews 6, 4 through 6? Get people interacting with the Word. It's not about us. It's about the power of God's Word. Paul said that that's the power unto salvation. This is the power, not you. We're putting too much on ourselves. People are saved and converted by God's Word, not by the delivery of some uh, skilled teacher. We need to quit giving ourselves a pass. You know the word. And I know you know this. You know what you did to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't know that, now we, we got to start questioning whether you're even in the body. And you know you can't do something and not understand it. If that were the case, we'd just get a mobile baptistry and just start going down the neighborhood, just grabbing people and dunking them in water, and they'd be saved. Uh-uh. You must understand what you're doing. So I'm assuming that you understood what you did when you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And can't you tell people that? Can't you? you? You may not know all the nuances of Revelation. You may not know all uh, the, the ins and outs of the minor prophets, but you can tell people what you did to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Then you need to be teaching that. And I need to be teaching that. Christianity is a teaching religion. Don't procrastinate when it comes to teaching. So the question that I began with, I end with. Are you living in anticipation of the second coming of the Lord? Folks, Jesus is coming back. That is a fact. And not only is he coming back, but we don't know when he's coming back. We've said it every night, and I, don't, I hope you don't think that because the, the night came and went and he didn't come, that it was untrue for me saying 
He could have come Monday night, and he could have. He could have come Tuesday night, and he might very well come tonight. We just don't know. That's the thing. And so if we don't know that, and we know something else, that the state in which we are when he comes back, that's the state that we're going to be judged in, and we don't know when that's going to happen, then we've got to stay faithful, right? That just makes sense. There's no time that I can gamble with my soul and say, oh, I can afford to be a little unfaithful here. No, I've got to stay faithful. I've got to be right with the Lord. And for those of us that are in the body, we need to not procrastinate about getting sin out of our lives. And those of us who are in the body, we need to not procrastinate about teaching others. But there may be a group of folks here that are not even in the body. And let's talk to you for a second. If you haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Lord comes, there's just no hope. None. I don't want you to, 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 be, to be fooled by that, deceived by that. I don't care who you think you are. If you are not washed by the blood of Jesus, there's no hope for you when the Lord comes back. And so what do you do about that? Well, you do the same thing that those of us who are in the body do. You obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. You can do that right here, right now, in this place. You can obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can hear the gospel message that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth, lived, in a man, was tempted, uh, lived as a man, was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, went to the cross, willingly died, shed divine blood for us, was right, raised from the dead three days later. That's the gospel message. And you can avail yourself of that by hearing it and then believing it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, came from heaven, lived as a man, died on the cross, shed divine blood for us, and then was raised from the dead? Do you believe that? And then based on that belief, will you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And then based on that belief, will you repent of your former way of life? There's got to be a change in your life. And based on that belief, will you be baptized into Christ? That's not sprinkling, that's not pouring, because that's not what the Bible teaches. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not trying to question anybody's mama or grandmama. But, you know, when we talk about things of salvation, and, and I, I love my parents. My parents did some things for me that I could not do for myself. I have a, a great debt to them, but my parents are not the Lord. The Lord, that's, that's a whole nother level. And if the Lord says that you have to be baptized for mission of sins, which he did, then you have to be baptized from this year's sin. It doesn't matter what anybody else did or did not do. That's irrelevant. That's noise. And we're talking about the Lord here. The only person who could offer that sacrifice was Jesus. Not your mom, not your dad, not your grandma, not, not your cousin. There's nobody that's good enough to be on that cross except for Jesus. And Jesus says we have to be baptized in order to be saved. And if Jesus says that, who among us is going to say no? Who, who, who's going to challenge Jesus on that? I'm not. And Jesus says when you contact that blood of his, when you go down that watery grave of baptism, you're washed, you're cleansed. You come out of that watery grave, a new creature in Christ. You're different. You're not the same person. And now you have a new lease on life. The whole purpose of your existence is to seek and to save that which is lost. And that is a wondrous thing. And as you do that, as we've said every night, Take heed unto yourself. Make sure that you are following these principles. Make sure you're obeying these principles. Make sure you're doing the things that you're teaching. And Paul says, if you do those sorts of things, you know what happens? You save yourself and you save those who hear you as you proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're not here and you haven't done that, my question is, why not tonight? Why not tonight? Why not do it? Don't, don't worry about fear. Don't worry about embarrassment. Don't worry about what people are going to think. All of those things are about a single-minded focus. I've got to get my soul right with the Lord. We, we had an example of that with, with Lily Hudson. Remember that? She had that single-minded focus. I'm sick. I'm not feeling well. I'm not even at the building. But my soul is not right. And if the Lord comes tonight, I know the outcome. And so she got here. And she was baptized in Christ. That's a child who understood enough to save her soul and make herself right with God. You can do the same thing tonight. Don't let embarrassment, don't let tradition, don't let pride get in the way of your soul's salvation. Do what is right, and then the angels in heaven will rejoice, and you'll have the greatest sleep you've ever had, safe in the arms of Jesus. It doesn't matter what. See, that's the thing. Once you get in Christ, it doesn't matter what the devil throws your way. Throw some cancer my way. Throw some hypertension, some, some heart disease. Throw me a loss of job. Uh, throw me some dysfunctionality in my family. I don't want it, but you can throw whatever you want to. 
You can't shake my joy. You can't shake my joy because this stuff is temporary, folks. And I'm going home. And nobody can stop me. Nobody can stop. You see, that's the kind of power. You know, that's why Nebuchadnezzar got so frustrated about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And here he was, the most powerful man in the universe. And, 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 and these three Hebrew slaves are saying, nah, we're not concerned. We're, we're just not going to bow down to that golden image. And he's like, this doesn't make any sense. I've got all this power at my disposal, and these guys dare to defy me. How do they do that? Because they're safe in the arms of their God. They're not worried about Nebuchadnezzar. They're not worried about what he can do. So you can kill me. You can't destroy my soul in hell. God can. That's the one I want to worry about. And so when you have that confidence, folks, it's amazing. He can go through anything. There's nothing the devil can throw at you that you can't get through. And again, I'm not trying to make fun of. I'm not minimizing. I'm not mocking some of the difficulty we can have. I'm telling you, folks, at the end of the day, we're all going to die. Hebrews 9, 27 is appointed men to die once and then the judgment. Let's get real. All of us are going to die unless we're here when the Lord comes back. And so if some of us die a little sooner than others, what difference does it make when it compared to eternity? Is someone going to get mad in heaven and say, oh, man, I didn't get to 70? You're in heaven. <laughs> What's wrong with you? It doesn't matter. You want to go back in time and get that extra 10 years you didn't get? Come on now. And again, I'm not trying to make light of it, but we've got to look at things through a spiritual lens. Through a spiritual lens, friends, there's nothing the devil can throw at us that we can't handle because God's going to be with us. And so that's what we're asking, folks. If you're not in Christ, why not tonight? And if you're a Christian, we've always said every service, you can have the prayers of the saints. Maybe you're going through something difficult. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe some of these things we've talked about don't come very easy. That, that's fine. We all struggle with something. But you have the ability to confess that in front of these folks or ask these folks for your prayers. And the thing about these folks is the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we got a lot of righteous people here. Just think about the collective effect of having all those folks lifting up your name to our Father who cares in the first place, right? Who wants to help you out. But now you have all of his children who are praying on your behalf. That's a powerful thing, folks. Why would we not want that? So if you are subject to the invitation, whether it is you want to be right with the Lord by obeying the gospel or you want the prayers of the saints to strengthen you in your walk with God, either way, if you're subject to the invitation, we ask you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.